Okay, let's get going. Some more people will show up. So today uh, we want to talk more about using the STAN language to write our own STAN programs. Um, and since we have people visiting today, and because I have to say this every damn time I teach, um, we're at Columbia, Columbia Develops STAN, Columbia Seeks Grants to Develop STAN, I use STAN in the like small amount of time I'm outside of Columbia and that creates the appearance of conflict of interest that everyone including on YouTube, should be aware of before listening to the rest of this presentation if you haven't uh, previously seen all the other um, ones this semester. So I want to talk, uh, pick up where we left off last time about a model for bowling, but this time do a hierarchical model for bowling. So what we did before was we were just estimating a single simplex of the probability for knocking down 0, 1, 2, up to 10 pins uh, on a first roll of frame of bowling and then renormalizing that to get a uh, conditional probability for what happens on your second roll of a frame of bowling. But that um, is not a particularly interesting model, I realize, not just because it involves bowling, but because what's really the point of uh, modeling, you know, people who are bowling, assuming they all have the same ability, they all have the same simplex, they all have the same probability of knocking down all these pins. However, uh, it's not too much additional work at all uh, to estimate a more realistic, although perhaps not more interesting model that allows the ability of all these bowlers to differ from one bowler uh, to the next. So to estimate a simplex of parameters for each of the bowlers that we have data on. Uh, we don't have that much data on that many bowlers. So this is one example where I could uh, find has uh, like 30 bowlers, professional bowlers who entered the US Open in 2010, but it only has their like first uh, so we have, if we parse the data this way, which is basically how we before, but not collapsing, um, it's now going to be a 30 element list, one for each bowler, and then a 10 by two array for how many pins they knock down on their first or second roll of each of those 10 frames of bowling and ignoring any sort of special uh, considerations about the 10th and last frame. Uh, so that will give us the data structure that we need to estimate um, a hierarchical model, but we only have 10 frames of data um, on each of these uh, bowlers, so not a whole lot of information. And if you think about it, uh, there's really no way you could uh, distinguish among professional bowlers or professional golfers or professional at anything on the basis of such limited data. So like the difference between the best bowler in the world and like merely a person who makes their living bowling is like a couple pins per game on average, uh, maybe something like that. And so if you just see like one game, um, you know, basically anybody could finish ahead of, of anybody in order to really like, um, you know, say, you know, here's the probability that this person is the best bowler or something like that in, in 2010, you would need a lot more frames of data, but you could handle that with the same model, uh, basically, that we're going to write now. So uh, we had uh, this function that we wrote before on Tuesday, uh, bowling underscore kernel dot stand, and we can actually use that same function um, in this multi-level version of the bowling model. So in my data block, I'm going to declare the knowns, both the exogenous ones and the endogenous ones. So known uh, J, which is the number of bowlers. Uh, so that has a lower bound of 
uh, zero, or you could call it a lower bound of, of one. Uh, it's actually 30, but in any event, that's a count. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense for that to be negative. The only uh, real major, not even major, but um, important change to the code that we had before. So before we just had X1, X2 was this two dimensional integer array because we collapsed all the data on all the different bowlers together. Um, but now what I'm going to do and in part to illustrate these multi-dimensional integer array data structure declare x1, x2 as an integer array with three dimensions, j for the number of bowlers, 10 for the number of frames, 2 for the number of rolls per frame. And those are, uh, it's an integer array, so the cells of that are going to be integers and they have a lower bound of zero for a gutter ball and an upper bound of 10. So that's another aspect before I forget that makes this sort of challenging. Um, yes, in principle, you could uh, have someone roll a gutter ball and not get you know any pins knocked down. Uh, that happens like once in a blue moon in professional bowling, but it didn't actually happen in this data set. So you can tell from these data that the probability of getting a gutter ball for a professional bowler is low. Uh, but estimating exactly when that is, uh, when it never happens, is um, not something you're going to get a whole lot of relative precision on. But anyway, I now have a three-dimensional array of data with uh, 10 frames and two rolls for each of the J bowlers. Gonna pass in a vector that's non-negative of 11 shapes uh, for my Dirichlet clay prior on uh, the overall probabilities, which we'll see in a second. And there's a scale factor that's going to be on top of the theta parameter that I declare in the parameters block. So under, I'm not using transform data uh, in this particular case. We'll use it more um, in the next example. Uh, so jump straight to the parameters block where you declare all the exogenous unknowns in this particular model. So I'm gonna start off by declaring a simplex of size 11, uh, which you can think of you know, for professional bowlers or professional bowlers as a whole, um, or not really. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a, Definitely a sense in which like traditional frequentist estimation wouldn't work particularly well for or the way of thinking about it wouldn't work well for something like this. So we definitely do not have a random sample of bowlers. These are all professionals, nor is this a random sample of professional bowlers. This is uh, 30 bowlers who like qualified for this bowling tournament by winning other bowling tournaments. And so it's very hard to think of these people as a sample uh, from any particular uh, population. If you did, it would be sampling sort of selected on ability. But anyway, for these 30 people, we can think about them as sort of, uh, there's this overall probability of uh, knocking down all of these pins. And then each bowler deviates from that by you know perhaps a small amount. And the amount of deviation uh, is going to be governed by this uh, scalar non-negative parameter theta. This is actually a concentration parameter rather than a scale parameter. So like on the homework, you had tau, which was sort of the standard deviation across studies or whatever in the estimates. Uh, theta is you know higher values of theta indicate closer concentration to the overall uh, parameters view. Uh, but in any event, for each of the, uh, so what this means here, simplex are, uh, have an object named pi. It has j elements to it, one for each bowler. And then uh, each of those elements uh, in that array is a simplex of size 11, giving the probabilities of knocking down all these different numbers of pins for each bowler. And so that is the syntax we use there. It's named pi. It has j elements to it. Each of those j elements is a simplex of size 11. 
and the degree to which the Jake Bowler's uh, simplex of parameters differs from the overall uh, mu simplex of parameters is governed by how small or how big theta is. So theta actually captures sort of the, the concentration of the pi's around mu. So bigger values of theta, the closer everyone's pi is to mu, smaller values of theta, the more uh, dispersion there would be from one bowler to the next in their probability of knocking down uh, pins. So question is how I've set up uh, the first couple blocks. Okay. So then in the model block, uh, what we did on Tuesday, we just called our function. Um, <clears throat> so you can write a function that just basically does the entire model block for you and reduce it to one line, probably more common uh, for you to see the model block have a number of lines that sort of build up the log numerator of uh, Bayes' rule. So I'm going to start off by declaring another vector that's just equal to mu times theta uh, or mu times theta times my um, uh, value s that I test in as uh, the data. And so this is going to get passed to the bowling kernel function that we used on Tuesday, uh, but this is being called in a loop. So I'm calling it 30 times, one for each bowler, uh, passing it in that bowler's uh, values of pi, that bowler's theta, uh, and using mu theta as uh, what goes into the Dirichlet prior for that bowler's simplex of probabilities. And so basically, you know, the main difference between what we're doing today and what we were doing on Tuesday when we had the flat model versus what we're doing today with this multi-level model is we have to loop over the bowlers instead of just collapsing them all together. Uh, but we're still just calling the same function we were calling before. It's just now we're calling it, you know, passing different uh, elements of pi and different elements of the data to it. So that <clears throat> builds up uh, the log likelihood function and uh, incorporates the priors uh, for each of the elements of pi. And then uh, all that's remaining in order for us to finish out the numerator of, of Bayes' rule in log units <clears throat> is to add the log PDF for the prior on mu which is just uh, like we were doing before, mu given a, a pass into the data block, and we need a prior on um, theta, the concentration, and so I'll give that a exponential prior. And so um, one of the things you might have asked about is uh, well, why did I multiply this by s? So because uh, theta is multiplied by s and then uh, passed in here, it's equivalent if I hadn't multiplied by s, and then I made the prior on theta given you know one over s to be the expectation under exponential distribution. Both of those would imply the same posterior distribution, but it's easier for Stan to sample efficiently from a posterior distribution if all of the parameters that it's trying to estimate are like between negative 10 and 10 and not too close to zero. And so you can get efficiency advantages by sort of putting things uh, you know, with a scale of one, and then when you need to use them, scaling them up by your prior scale for any distribution like the exponential or the gamma or whatever um, that has a scale parameter in it. And so like, you know, exponential, one over s is equivalent in distribution to exponential one multiplied by s. So it's basically, it implies all the same information about the pi and, uh, and mu and whatever. Uh, it just makes it a little bit easier for Stan to do things with the numerical accuracy it needs in order to get around the posterior distribution. 
So questions about any of that? So, I mean, this is a lot like uh, the homework, really. Uh, you know, if you think about the units of observation, in that case being the study, and then there's sort of these sort of overall level parameters that studies deviate from. Well, you know, pi or the elements of pi are like the deltas. How much does this bowler differ from the typical bowler in this bowling tournament? Overall parameters given by mu, and we just have sort of one or two whatever levels of multi-level model um, going on, where, you know, inside the bowling kernel function that we did on Tuesday, the, the prior for each element of mu j is going to depend on, or pi is going to depend on mu theta. Yes? Um, the concentrated parameter, that's just like Uh, kind of, except it's concentration rather than standard deviation. Uh, so bigger theta, more the, the more the bowlers are clustered together, and then smaller theta, the more they are apart. That's a property of the Dirichlet um, <clears throat> that if you sort of represent the hyperparameter of a Dirichlet as uh, positive times simplex, the variance of it is inversely um, in this case, theta, but it's the same idea. It's just concentration versus standard deviation. Uh, but yeah, just like studies sort of differ from the truth, one professional bowler differs from the typical professional bowler by probably a small amount in the probability of like getting a strike and a nine and all that stuff. So yeah, I mean, only real difference here is we have 11 parameters for each unit rather than just one um, in the case of like a meta-analysis um, like we did on the homework, but not a real fundamental difference and not really that much difference in code from what we were doing on Tuesday. And now we sort of have a more appropriate model, we just don't really have an appropriate amount of data to be, you know, precisely estimating, like, who, what bowler has the largest probability of getting a strike or something like that. Other questions? All right. So we go to estimate this, we call stan, we give it the file, which was on the previous one, bowling for a multi-level model. Uh, had to bump up adapt delta a little bit in order to get rid of some of the divergent transitions. That by itself uh, was not particularly a problem. Again, pass in the data in much the same way uh, that we did before. This refresh equals zero, all that does is um, stop Stan from printing out like 10% done, 20% done, 30% done, which, you know, you don't need to put on a slide, uh, but it can tell you something about um, how much of the progress uh, Stan has completed. And then we print it all out and we get um, a thing like this. And so these mu's, uh, posterior means of them, it's a simplex, are pretty close to what we were estimating on Tuesday when we didn't have any, uh, we were estimating a flat model without any variation from one bowler to the next. We were just estimating one overall simplex. And so this is all pretty similar. I'm not showing um, all the pi values because there were like 330 of them. And so you can do that by specifying pars equal pi and then include equal false means exclude pi. Uh, or I could have done it the other way around, like mu and theta, and then include equal true. That would just include in the printout uh, mu and theta. So anyway, uh, the additional parameter uh, at the overall level theta has a posterior mean of 7.76, uh, but it's relatively large standard deviation. Uh, so it's hard to estimate 
uh, that with a great deal of, of certainty, but it's certainly, um, you know, well above the prior that we used um, of one. Uh, so, you know, much larger expectation. And that's basically saying, well, it has <clears throat> the ability to learn from the data that there's not much difference from one bowler to the next. Uh, but, you know, making that more precise statement would require a lot more data than just one game for each of these 30 um, bowlers. So another thing that you might see here is the effective sample size is lower than a lot of the other times that we have uh, seen. And so this is fairly difficult for Stan to get uh, efficient sampling from so you know for most of these it's like a few hundred it's probably fine uh but you know on four thousand uh you know sometimes we are uh draws after uh warm-up you know 243 is one of the lower effective sample size the nominal sample size uh we've seen and so this one gets a lot of positive autocorrelation uh, in the Markov chain, at least for these parameters. I didn't show it, but if you look at the effective sample size for the pies, they're much bigger. Now, those are fine. Uh, but these ones are kind of low uh, by Stan standards. Uh, I, I think it's okay. It's certainly better than what, like, any other Bayesian software would be able to do for um, a model like this. But it, you know, sort of shows that um, you know, going, not making a whole lot of changes, going from a flat model to an arguably more risk, realistic multi-level model uh, makes it a lot more difficult to draw from a posterior distribution like this. Not just because we went from estimating like 11 parameters on Tuesday to 350 or something today with all the pies. So there's 30 and then there's 11 of them. So, and then the mu's and the theta. Uh, but also because of the shape of the posterior distribution in this 330 dimension. So Stan had to take smaller step sizes, uh, got more autocorrelation, but still like probably a few hundred effective sample sizes is enough uh, to estimate these mu's, you know, with as much precision as, uh, you know, you really cared about, but uh, less than what you would get for like a typical regression model or um, something along those lines. Questions about the output? Um, so here is a uh, pairs plot for some of the parameters. I've excluded mu and pi to just focus on uh, theta. So theta is that concentration parameter. It has its marginal posterior distribution in the top left there. And then its association with LP um, underscore underscore, which is really the target variable in our STAN program, the, the value of the numerator uh, in log units of, of Bayes' rule. Um, and then there's this energy thing, which we'll talk about in a second. So what do we want to emphasize uh, from this? First, you know, okay, the, the marginal uh on theta looks you know pretty reasonable maybe it has somewhat long uh right tail but its association with any other unknown can involve uh weird shapes um it's certainly positively correlated with the value uh, in in lp so the bigger values of theta the higher the numerator is that's not interesting in and of itself but we could have put any other mu or something up there and seen uh, a rather stark association in the posterior distribution conditional on the parameters. Um, that's okay. What's not great is for there to be so much of association between any of the parameters and the energy thing. This has to do with the momentum that gets randomly sampled uh, from a normal distribution to push the thing around under Hamiltonian dynamics. So energy is always going to be negatively associated with the target variable, and it certainly is in this case. It 
ideally would not be so negatively associated with any of the parameters. When that happens, the effective sample size tends to be a lot lower uh, than what we've seen before, where sometimes the effective sample size is larger than the nominal sample size. Um, but, you know, th this is still in the range of probably um, acceptable. It's just when you get warnings from Stan saying, you know, Bayesian infraction of missing information is low, look at the pairs plot. What it's telling you is, well, look at what values of the parameters are highly associated with this uh, auxiliary parameter energy and think about maybe how could you reparameterize the model to reduce the dependence there so we could get around the posterior distribution in a more efficient fashion. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out from this plot um, is these typical values of the numerator of base rule and log units. Okay, that has an almost normal looking um, <clears throat> distribution, but you know, occasionally you get pretty far out in the, the tail here, and that corresponds to a uh, value of the uh, numerator of base rule and log units of like negative 750. Okay, well, whatever. But a more typical value of LP that is more, you know, commonly around negative 900. So a difference in 150 in log units between the mode, which is the highest value of the logarithm of the numerator of base rule, which, you know, occurs out here and gets a value of about 750. But most of the values that get sampled where most of the probability is, is like 150 log units away, which is huge, um, you know, around negative 900. And that illustrates a phenomenon that can happen in a lot of models, but happens um, especially often in multi-level models is that the area around the posterior mode has almost no probability in it. So you have a very like, and then all of a sudden it gets really steep really quickly and that's the posterior mode. But where most of the posterior probability lies is in these bigger regions away from the mode. And that is what we see here. You know, most of the values of theta are like in here and they, you know, correspond to a value of the numerator base rule like negative 900. But occasionally with very small probability, it can get out to, to negative 750 or so. And that's where the posterior mode is. Uh, but that just means the posterior mode is not at all reflective of the posterior mean, which was like seven or whatever, or the posterior median, which was probably even smaller. Like the posterior mode is going to correspond to a value of theta around 20. But that's not average or in the middle or in any way typical. And that goes to underscore this idea that the posterior mode is really just a red hair. You don't want to worry about it at all. If you were going to worry about any one number summary, it would be the mean or the median or something like that. Uh, the value of you know, the one point in the parameter space that has the highest posterior density doesn't really tell you anything much less everything that you would need to know about the whole posterior distribution. It's just one point. Um, and it's not really any more important than any other point. Now the mean, the median, etc., those are sort of like a function of all the points. And so it's sort of like a super point. Uh, but the mode is just one point. It's no different from like 12. Um, it just happens to have higher density there. And that phenomenon, which happens a lot uh, in multi-level models, trips a lot of people up because they're accustomed to thinking, well, whatever has high density is going to have high probability. But that's not the case when the regions of high density have low volume. 
Um, and so thinking, you know, too much about the normal distribution where the mean, median, and the mode all coincide to the same number due to the symmetry of like a univariate normal distribution. But in uh, posterior distributions with a lot of parameters, posterior distributions with multi-level structure to them, it is uh, the rule rather than the exception that the mode is far removed from the median uh, and the mean and things like that. Uh, so don't get too hung up on the posterior mode. And that also underscores why these approaches that sometimes claim to be Bayesian, but use optimization rather than MCMC and find the mode and stop rather than finding the whole posterior distribution and drawing from it with the corresponding probability are not yielding, you know, true Bayesian answers. So if you went to the mode and stopped, you'd be all the way out there. And that isn't, you know, representative of all um, of the posterior distribution. It's at like the edge of the posterior distribution. Does everybody understand that point? Thinking about prior modes is okay in order like to choose, you know, shape parameters from a beta distribution or whatever. Uh, but posterior mode, like after stand is done, is just not even worth worrying about. But people sort of think, oh, well, it's the value of the parameters that's most likely given the data. And that's sort of true, but um, that's not as relevant as the people who make a big deal out of the posterior mode. Uh, seem to think. Got it? Okay. Uh, so the next thing we want to talk about is something called SPC or simulation based calibration. So uh, Sean Taltz and a number of other people in and around uh, Columbia have a paper on archive where they propose uh, this concept of simulation based calibration uh, based on some things uh, that Samantha Cook did like 10 years ago and Geyer and some other people. It's been an idea that's talked about every once in a while in the Bayesian analysis, but um, when the most uh, recent version of this paper came out, really formalized the following idea um, in a very interesting and useful way. And so the key idea idea underlying uh, this paper is that if you obtain a posterior distribution and that posterior distribution is conditional on data that is drawn from the prior predictive distribution, uh, the posterior distribution that results in that can't be systematically different from the prior. So if you condition on data that was drawn from the prior predictive distribution, you would expect to get back your prior in the posterior. And so really, if you're sort of generating from the prior predictive distribution, conditioning on that, getting a posterior distribution conditional on those realizations from the prior predictive distribution, all you're doing is treading water. You've got your prior, you draw from the prior, you take those realizations from the prior, draw from the prior predictive distribution, take those realizations from the prior predictive distribution, condition on them to update your beliefs, but those draws from the prior predictive distribution uh, came from your model, so to speak. And so there's no real net updating going on. You get back a posterior distribution that at best is only randomly different from your prior distribution. It can't mathematically be systematically different from your prior distribution. However, if you observe that it is, uh, that would imply that you have a failure of your software because uh, the math can't fail. And so this provides us a good way to check uh, that your stand program is uh, written correctly or at least consistently provides a way to check whether Stan or maybe some other software, but mostly Stan, is capable of handling a posterior distribution like that and by doing the following steps. So you draw realizations from your prior that's 
uh, theta tilde. You use those realizations of theta tilde to draw from the prior predictive distribution of the endogenous known, so the conditional distribution of y, uh, conditional on the realization of theta that you got in the previous step. Then you use uh, those realizations of y tilde to draw from the posterior distribution of the parameters, conditional, so that should be a tilde rather than a hat. Um, so those realizations. Draw from the posterior distribution of uh, <clears throat> the parameters conditional on your realizations from the prior predictive distribution. And then when you're all done, evaluate the, pro the probability, the proportion of times that your draws from the posterior distribution are greater than or less than uh, the realizations that you got from the prior in, in step one. And basically that should be a uniform distribution um, in these, is it bigger than or less than um, those values across many runs of this, if the software is working well. And so this is number four is sort of our way of evaluating whether uh, this posterior distribution that we're getting is not systematically different from <clears throat> the prior distribution that we were drawing from. Uh, and if it is, we know something has gone wrong with the implementation. Because if we could do this, if we could do the integrals and stuff analytically, uh, we would get back the same priors that we started. Questions about that idea. And so it's called or referred to as simulation-based calibration um, because the posterior distribution in Bayes' rule is well calibrated with respect to its prior distribution. So if you say, you know, this probability that it's going to be less than this or whatever is 10%, uh, well, you should get back in the posterior distribution the same thing. And the same is true for any quantile that <clears throat> uh, you want to pick. And so four, if you plot it out as a histogram, should look like a uniform uh, density. And there's a couple links on the slide that you can click on uh, for more information, both a paper and a less formal, considerably less formal uh, by Dan Simpson blog post <clears throat> um, about this idea. Dan Simpson is actually, I'll put this up on Campus Wire, uh, in town from Canada and Australia uh, and giving an extension or an updated version of the talk that was on the syllabus a few weeks ago about uh, you know visualizing and verifying whether software is working correctly. Anyway, he's going to be giving an update of that talk on Monday at four in the stat department. And so I'll put more information um, up on Campus Wire uh, so you can go to that if you have time. But we want to do an example of using simulation-based calibration to uh, figure out if we've implemented a model non-trivial model correctly. But does everybody understand the idea behind this, particularly this idea? Whatever. Uh, that if you condition on data that was drawn from a prior predictive distribution, the posterior distribution that results from that is going to be the prior. or at least everybody can understand that if that's true, which it is, we have a way to check our software, draw from the prior, draw from the prior predicted distribution, condition on that, get back your posterior distribution, not involving any wild data. <clears throat> uh, get back the posterior distribution and then in some sense see if that posterior distribution is way different from the prior because that's not supposed to happen. And if it does, it's a software problem. And so this gets back to what I was calling the fourth source of uncertainty. Uncertainty as to whether your software is working as advertised. Uh, 
that's a difficult thing to provide guarantees about, but it's an easier thing to provide warnings about when it looks like it's breaking down. It's an easier thing to provide procedures where you can look into this sort of thing yourself. And so when you're writing STAN programs, you need to go through this process to make sure, okay, you've done it right, but also even if you've done it right, it's possible that the posterior distribution uh, you've written isn't really amenable to STAN. It might have too much curvature. You might have to change the ADAPT delta or whatever in order to get rid of divergent transitions, but you should be able to ascertain all of those things if you sort of take the time to do SBC. Okay, um, so the model that we want uh, to do SPC on is going to be an instrumental variables model. So I want to talk uh, briefly about that. Instrumental uh, variables is a technique that is very common in economics and is becoming increasingly common outside of economics where these directed acyclic graphs are a more common way of representing theories. And so if you're not uh, familiar with uh, graphs like these, uh, the arrows indicate the possibility uh, that the sort of um, parent variable is a cause of the child variable. Uh, so in this case, X is potentially a cause of Y, but there's also this unobserved U, an uh, error term, uh, that is possibly a cause of Y, possibly a cause of X. And the presence of this um, error term that is, you know, involved in the, the outcome Y, but also correlated with the X variable means that you can't just do a regular uh, regression or differences in means or stratified estimator or anything like that uh, to estimate what this effect of X on Y is. Is and so this path from x against the arrow uh, into y is what's known as a biasing uh, path. And if you just had like these three variables here, or you don't have u, it's unobserved. If you had u, then you could make some progress. But if you just had x and y, you wouldn't be able to estimate, no matter how much data you had, the causal effect of x on y with any estimator uh, due to the additional association between x and y induced by this error term that is uh, correlated with your predictor variable x. Uh, but in this situation, you don't just have x and y. You also have z. And z is a special sort of variable known as a instrument. It has... Um, the essential properties that um, there's no arrow from Z into Y, or there's no arrow from, there's no path from Z to Y except through the variable of interest X. Um, and there is an association, it doesn't have to be causal, but there is an association uh, under the graph <clears throat> between Z and X that we want to leverage in order to get uh, estimate of the causal effect of X on Y. And so if you write down uh, one of these graphs um, representing your theory, then there's algorithms that can be applied to graphs saying, you know, this is what you need to condition on. You would be able to identify the causal effect of, you know, your treatment variable and your outcome variable if you condition on this or that. And I think these algorithmic um, approaches are um, fairly recent in terms of having like R packages that would do this sort of thing for you and fairly useful because they, in this is a very simple model, uh, but in more complicated ones, it's easy for people to make mistakes in the logic um, of the graph. Uh, in terms of what would be implied if you conditioned on this and didn't condition on that, etc. Uh, but computers don't make logic mistakes. Uh, and so provided you have a correct implementation of the algorithm and there's a lot of very clever people who are 
doing implementations of these graph-based algorithms and whatnot uh, these days, it can sort of tell you unambiguously, yes, you could estimate the causal effect on X and Y through instrumental variables estimators if this is the data generating process. And so uh, a lot of this stuff on directed acyclic graphs uh, goes back to a computer science uh, scientist um, named Judea Pearl, who has been uh, writing books and papers and uh, for a while, uh, I think, there was a question on Canvas Wire back toward the beginning of the class. I think it was Keith who asked, <clears throat> um, you know, so Pearl is out with a new book and uh, had, you know, a lot of people talking about it and stuff like that. And he came across a quote of Pearl's from some other paper that he wrote, uh, which sort of, you know, he said out in the first paragraph, I've pretty much, you know, since my second year of grad school or whatever, always been a Bayesian um, philosophically, but he's sort of had uh, more and more doubts as to whether the Bayesian approach to estimation was really um, adequate. And the main thing that he thinks is uh, missing is that, you know, people who are doing applied statistics not specifying their theory of the data generating process in terms of what or these directed acyclic graphs before they go to start estimating things. And so they're just, uh, you know, and this has become especially prevalent with the supervised learning rise of that, where, you know, they're usually not even pretending to try to estimate causal effects, but this idea of you just sort of take a bunch of predictive variables that happen to be in your data set and you condition on them uh, in some sort of a regression model and expect to get out a causal estimate of like anything you want um, is not a good intuition to have because what you do or do not condition on can change, uh, you know, whether the thing that you're estimating represents a causal effect or not. And so what uh, Pearl and uh, people who uh, buy into this uh, approach are always, you know, talking about, well, first you have to specify one of these graphs, which is another language for representing your theory, apply one of the graph algorithms, and it will tell you what you need to condition on or if it's possible to estimate a causal effect before you go on uh, trying to estimate things. And you can find, uh, depending on you know the nature of the data generating process, that conditioning on this or that variable can do some unintuitive things in terms of the conclusion uh, as to what estimator, if any, would be giving you estimates of uh, causal effect. But in this case, it's relatively simple. You wouldn't actually need a fancy algorithm, but um, it's available in this uh, GGDAG uh, package it's uh, calling out. So anyway, uh, but I think Pearl has uh, more recently uh, started to wear on the patience of um, everybody else with you know all this stuff that you know all of applied statistics is just like you know data mining uh because no one is taking the time to represent out these um theories and that is uh certainly a true statement when applied to um a lot of people uh who are doing these sorts of things but as far as i know um and i could be wrong uh but i don't think uh, he or uh, any of his students or anything like that have written a paper uh, talking about the connections or maybe the deficiency between this way of representing your theory as to how the data are generated and what we have been calling generative models. And so you might say, okay, well, if we wrote down some sort of generative model for this, it would basically include all of this information plus additional information about our priors and the distributions that we're using and whatnot. But you know, if you have one of these circles, a node, a variable that doesn't have an arrow pointing into it, that is going to be an exogenous variable. So those sorts of things would be in like the top left box when you know we've been talking about um, generative models. Um, like lurking in here is uh, some sort of parameter that 
captures how strong the relationship between X, uh, Z and X is. It's not explicitly written. Uh, it's sort of uh, referred to by the arrow, but it's not explicitly talked about um, in these directed acyclic graphs because uh, in principle, uh, particularly the computer scientists and whatever that work on these things like to come up with estimators uh, that don't make distributional assumptions. Like if you had an infinite amount of data, could you estimate the thing uh, without assuming linearity or normality or, or whatever? And, you know, that's nice. But with finite data, you're always going to have to make um, stronger assumptions than you might like in order to estimate the thing. So this does not imply or require that the relationship between Z and X has to be linear, for example, but you might, when going to estimate it, um, make that um, additional assumption, in which case the strength of the relationship between Z and X can be captured by some coefficient, an exogenous unknown. And then in a generative model, you have to have a prior distribution on that. But anyway, the network of arrows and, and nodes or whatever basically says how the endogenous known, the Y variable, is generated under your theory. And the priors that you specify on all these coefficients and not reflect what you believe to be um, you know, causal structural parameters <clears throat> that you know, you're putting these uh, prior beliefs on before you condition on the data. So I think, uh, in my opinion, there's a lot of connections um, between this approach specifying sort of the outline of a theory in terms of a directed acyclic graph um, and the code implementing a generative model that sort of corresponds to the same data generating process, but fills in more details about what the distributions are and you know your priors and, and things like that. And so I think uh, you know, certainly there's not enough people writing down generative models either. But serious Bayesian people have been doing that, talking about that for a long time. Uh, and I'm not sure that like this stream of tweets uh, that Pearl has been authoring for the past several months um, is totally uh, up to date with this sort of, of thinking that we've been pushing in a class like this. Uh, so questions about these directed acyclic graphs as a way of representing the theory correspondence to generative models, et cetera? So uh, if we were economists, uh, we would unfortunately tend to be frequentists. Um, and they've come up with a number, actually several, uh, frequentist estimators for a situation like this. And the simplest one, if Z is a binary variable and you just have like one X, uh, which is endogenous, oh, I should really point out because usually uh, particularly the, the people that don't really write down the theories. Uh, predictor and exogenous variable kind of mean the same thing. But in this case, our predictor X is endogenous. It's got an arrow pointing into it from Z. Now, there's an arrow going from X to Y, so X is a predictor of Y. But it's not an exogenous predictor of Y. It's endogenous. And so a generative model or a directed exogenous graph needs to give an account, a story, a theory for how X is generated in addition to how Y is generated. Anyway, so um, when there's only one endogenous predictor X, no control variables, uh, other, you can in general have other variables going on in a system like this. But in this very simple three variable uh, theory, uh, you can actually estimate the causal uh, effect of X on Y in a sort of indirect way. The so-called uh, walled estimator when Z is binary. Walled is an interesting character, by the way. But anyway, uh, the estimated causal effect of X on Y can be represented as the estimated covariance 
between y and z divided by the estimated covariance between x and z? When z is binary. Um, and uh, that gives the so-called instrumental variable estimator of this arrow here. Uh, not just, you know, through regular regression. You have to do um, some other stuff. And uh, it can be shown in large samples that the typical covariance estimator that's, you know, implemented in R and every other software uh, is asymptotically normal across data sets and centered on the true, like, population covariance between Y and Z. So we have unbiased estimators of the numerator and denominator here. We have, you know, some results that each of them are asymptotically normal across data sets that are randomly sampled from this population here. But what is the distribution across data sets of the ratio of two normal variables? Ratio of two normals by very normal? No, not even close. One, it's univariate. So the, the ratio is one number. But um, what distribution is it? Bounded at zero. Not bounded at zero. So covariances can be either positive or negative. It is what we did on the homework. Way back in early January or early February, something like that, the climate model. They used that distribution uh, for like two atmospheric things that they thought were uh, normal. Now they truncated that to 0, 10. But why did they do that? Or what would be the dis what is the distribution like if you don't truncate it? How far does the tail go? Huge, crazy, and that comes from the possibility that this denominator piece can arbitra be arbitrarily close to zero. And if you do this over and over and over again, eventually you're gonna, uh, you know, just by chance alone, get a covariance between X and Z that is very close to zero. And then you divide by something very close to zero, you get something very close to And so it's actually weirder in this case because what we did on the homework, uh, the numerator and the denominator were independent norms. In this case, they're not gonna be independent because Z appears in both the numerator and the denominator, but if you scrolled a little bit farther down that Wikipedia article that you were, you know, basing your second homework off of, it told you an even more complicated way to derive the distribution of two correlated normal variables, but it has the same property of these huge tails due to the possibility that the denominator could be like essentially zero um and this it, and it's the same thing with the four or five other estimators of instrumental variable models that the frequentists have have come up with um they have basically terrible finite sample properties uh the estimator is asymptotically normal but for any finite n uh, unless in some situations where you have like more instruments than you have endogenous predictor, but in the typical case where you just have like one of each, uh, the sampling distribution does not have a mean. The tails are so heavy that the mean does not exist. And that implies, okay, even if we could do this experiment like over and over and over again, as many times as we want, and average the results at the end, 
across all the data sets that we collected. Would we get the right answer? No, we would not. The mean doesn't exist. Now, it is the case the median, if we do this over and over and over again, is going to be centered on the true causal effects. So it's so-called median unbiased. But it's not unbiased unbiased because the mean doesn't even exist. And you know, usually when we say unbiased, we mean the expectation of the estimator equal to the thing that it's estimating. But the expectation of the estimator doesn't exist in this case because the tails are so heavy. And I think that underscores the sort of uh, what I think is a weird uh, characteristic of the frequentist approach to things is, OK, let's say for some reason we're interested in the probability distribution of an estimator across data sets. Can't really imagine why, but let's just assume we have a reason. OK, you work out the sampling distribution of an estimator in cases like this, and it's terrible. Like it's not a good, because of the ratio nature of it, it's not like a good sampling distribution. It's not like you have, you know, small variants or anything like that. You have these tails that go out to 100,000 or whatever if you do enough draws um, from this process. And so it's not like the sampling distributions have to be, you know, in any way desirable in order for everyone in economics to be using instrumental variables estimators. They just have to be known. They don't even have to be known in finite samples. They just have to be known asymptotically. So as long as we know what the distribution of the estimator would be, if we have more data than what you actually have, then you can go ahead and use it on any size data set that you want. And the fact that you can get sort of an arbitrarily bad estimate of the thing, particularly when this is not like bounded away from zero in the denominator here, is just like, eh, you know, what are you gonna do? So what you could do is a Bayesian estimator. Um, and we'll get into that um, a little bit. So the uh, most famous, one of the most famous examples comes from a paper uh, from Josh Angus uh, and Andy Kruger. Kruger actually died like a month ago, even though he was only like 50. Um, but anyway, this is one of the papers that he's most famous for getting uh, data on. Uh, so the outcome of interest here is a person's log wage or I think it's just men actually, because uh, that was you know typically what was uh, studied in, in labor market stuff. Um, so the person, men's log, uh, log wages, and what you're trying to estimate is the effect of schooling. Well, schooling is an endogenous predictor. People go to school in order to make more money, and there's all kinds of characteristics that you know people who are good at school stay in school longer, and they make more money without there necessarily being a causal relationship between those two. And so what this paper proposes is an instrument using the quarter in which someone was born and taking advantage of the fact that state laws say, like, you know, you have to start first grade depending on, like, if you were born before or after this date in combination with laws that say, like, you have to be this old or have been in school this long uh, before you can drop out of, of high school. And so basically people who are born in the first quarter of the year um, had to sort of start first grade young and they couldn't drop out until uh, later compared to uh, other people who are born in, in different times of the year. And so uh, people who are born in the first quarter of the year um, tend to have on average like a couple months more schooling than uh, people born in, in other times of the year. And so this enables us to estimate the causal effect of going from dropping out of high school to dropping out of high school a little bit later. So that's probably not going to be a super big effect and not one that you want to extrapolate to like what's the effect of college or graduate school. But, you know, the causal effect of staying in high school a little bit longer on your um, income and so we can get that data and we want to do, we're not sure that stan is going to work for something like this and so we want to do the svc approach and so this is how 
we do that. Um, we declare in the data block the number of observations, the instrument, which is just like, are you born in the first quarter of the year or not? Um, and the stuff for our priors. So that's going to be our data block. It's only going to uh, contain the exogenous notes. Then we're going to use the transform data block to draw from the prior and draw from the prior predictive distribution. Um, so this, we're not going to have time to get into it that much today, is the, okay, typical setup for one of these reduced form instrumental variables thing. We draw the intercept and the coefficient for the connection between Z and X from like normal priors, could be other priors, whatever. And then we draw alpha and beta, which is uh, the intercept and slope of the connection between X and Y from their normal priors. Uh, and then we have sigma X and sigma Y in this bivariate normal distribution of the errors. Okay, we've drawn from our priors. And then we loop over in and draw from the prior predictive distribution. Now I got cut off here, so you can't see me drawing from the distribution of Y, but I'm drawing from the bivariate distribution of X and Y because those are both endogenous knowns uh, under an instrumental variable mod. Okay, so it got cut off, but at the end of transform data, I have prior predictive realizations of x and y i declare in the parameters block the intercept and the slope for both uh parts of the model the standard deviations of the errors and the correlation between the reduced uh form errors i do this bivariate normal stuff that we've seen before in the transform parameters block uh, in order to implement a bivariate normal likelihood and in the model block um, first, I'm going to create the conditional expectations of mu x and mu y under an instrumental variables model. I have my priors on the unknowns, and then the likelihood piece got cut off here as well, but it's also a bivariate normal. <clears throat> anyway, running out of time, so I'm not going to talk uh, in too much more detail about that, but in your generated quantities block, when you do this SPC thing, uh, you need to compute a few things. First, you can copy over the endogenous known, uh, so you'll have that on the outside. You also need to calculate this array, in this case of six things. Is the posterior gamma that you declared in the parameters block bigger than the prior realization you got of gamma in the transform data block? That's something that should be true, like, uh, you know, 50% of the time on average. Yes. Yes, I have to go back between different slides. So one of the things we're calculating in generated quantities is gamma bigger than gamma underscore. Gamma is the posterior draw we got. Gamma underscore is the prior draw that we took. So that should be about a 50-50 thing if everything is working correctly. Do that for all the parameters. Also copy your realizations from transform data into a vector of size six called parse. And you can also calculate the log likelihood, but we're not gonna have time uh, to go into that because we only have like another minute or so. Anyway, there's a function in the next version of uh, RSTAN so you can download the file that you need to, but pretty soon it'll be in our stand, uh, where you can just call SPC, give it your compiled model and your data, and it will run that, in this case, like 50 times, probably should be more like 500. But anyway, do this over and over and over again. Draw from the prior, draw from the prior predictive. Conditional on the, condition on the realizations from the prior predictive. Get that posterior distribution back and see if the posterior distributions that you get back when you condition on prior predictive realizations are systematically different from the priors or are there some other problems? So in this case, uh, there were a number of divergent transitions. So I probably have to increase adapt delta in order to make this work. But moreover, I can look at the plot of the results of these sort of ranks variables so the alpha and the beta and the sigmas 
uh, or Sigma X at least sort of look okay, even though I didn't do nearly enough simulations in that the order statistics are all sort of pretty uniform here. But for Delta and for Gamma, uh, they're all concentrated over on the left side. And that indicates I made a mistake. The posterior distribution I was drawing from didn't correspond to the prior predictive distribution because I had a typo or some other thing that actually I didn't have time to figure out. But it was better to show you what this looks like when things go wrong because you can tell immediately this is not a uniform distribution. The posterior distribution of delta or gamma, whatever, was always less than the prior. And something went wrong. And when it's this extreme, it's you went wrong. Uh, but if it was sort of less extreme than this, well, maybe Stan just can't really draw from this posterior distribution that well. Anyway, out of time for today. I think they're probably going to come in and uh, kick us out soon. Um, didn't have. Uh, we'll talk about the homeworks on uh, Tuesday. So if you want to work on it more and re-upload it uh, before then, that's fine. Uh, but we'll talk about those on Tuesday and then start talking about another uh, paper that um, applies Stan in a causal inference setting.